Greetings YouTubers, my name is PhD Tony and today we're going to be discussing entropy, its role in atmospheric dynamics and why it is that the Earth's atmosphere does not require any form of container whatsoever. A primary point of flat Earth dogma is that the second law of thermodynamics disproves the existence of space. Their argument is that if space existed, then Earth's atmosphere would expand ad infinitum and would disappear into the vastness of space. The fact that Earth's atmosphere persists in existing suggests to them that space does not exist. This argument is specious nonsense. A rational person whose argument relied on the second law of thermodynamics might actually trouble to familiarise themselves with what this law actually states. Of course, flat earthers are not so encumbered. They have no idea what it states, much less do they have any idea what it actually means. The second law of thermodynamics states that the total entropy of an isolated system cannot decrease over time and can only remain constant if all processes occurring within the system are reversible. There are multiple technical terms in this law that need to be carefully defined. The first is what constitutes an isolated system. In thermodynamic terms, an isolated system is one which undergoes zero mass or energy exchange with other systems. This can be a result of either sheer physical remoteness or an intervening physical barrier. A system may be described as effectively isolated if the mass exchange or energy exchange with other systems is small. The next term we need to define is what we mean by a reversible process. Imagine a process that takes the physical system under consideration from its initial state to some subsequent state. The process is reversible if the system can be returned to its exact original state by a gradual sequence of steps. As we saw in our last video, the convection of gas packets within Earth's atmosphere is well approximated as being a reversible process. Before we move on to a discussion of the final term that we need to define, which is the concept of entropy itself, it is worth reflecting on just how profound the second law of thermodynamics is. As a result of this law, we now know the direction of time. Time is the direction in which the entropy of an isolated system increases. This may seem trivial to the layperson, but from the perspective of fundamental physics, it's actually quite important to have a formal definition of the direction in which time progresses. All of which is absolutely fascinating but depends critically on our ability to define what entropy actually is and determine when it is increasing and when it is decreasing. The concept of entropy was introduced by Rudolf Clausius in 1865. Clausius was investigating the operation of Carnot cycles. A Carnot cycle is a form of idealized reversible heat pump whose operation is summarized in the figure at the bottom of this slide. They are a very useful thought experiment for investigating thermodynamic principles, but I don't intend to spend too much time explaining them here. By analysing the properties of a gas packet as it moves through a Carnot cycle, Clausius was able to determine that the ability of the gas packet to do work was reduced by a constant multiple of the temperature of the gas packet. He also noted that any inefficiency in the Carnot cycle would only act to reduce the ability of the gas packet to do work. Based on these observations, Clausius defined entropy as the measure of a system's internal thermal energy per unit temperature that is unavailable for doing useful work. And he noted that while the universe contains a constant amount of energy, the amount of entropy in the universe is increasing as a function of time. In mathematical terms, we represent entropy by the symbol S. And we say that S is equal to Q divided by T, where Q is the total internal heat energy of the system and T is the temperature of the system. The second law of thermodynamics then says that dS is always greater than or equal to zero. The symbol Q stands for the total internal heat energy of the system, but this name is a little bit misleading. We normally think of heat and temperature as being the same thing, but in thermodynamics, that's not the case. The total internal heat energy has multiple components. The two that most concern us are the sensible heat, which is the heat that you can feel or sense, and the volumetric work done by the gas packet. There is also a latent heat term due to condensable materials such as water vapour, but I'm not really going to consider that here. 
So it may not seem like we've made any progress because it's not entirely clear what we mean by potential to do useful work. So let's consider an example. Consider the physical system shown in the diagram here. We have two reservoirs. In the initial configuration, the reservoir on the left is full of a gas. The reservoir on the right is as empty as we can make it, a vacuum. When we open the connection between the two reservoirs, the gas molecules will move so as to equilibrate the pressure between the two reservoirs. In this process, the gas's ability to do work has decreased. Its entropy has increased. Let us consider an air-powered car. If we use gas from a pressurized gas cylinder, that gas will have considerable energy that it can use to do work on the car and push it along. Similarly, a balloon has less energy available, but still some energy with which it can push the car. In contrast, a tied-off plastic bag has very little energy that it can contribute to pushing the air-powered car. The less ordered the gas becomes, the less energy it has available to do work. It is also possible to define entropy from the perspective of statistical mechanics. In this framework, entropy is a measure of the number of microstates consistent with a given macrostate. For a gas, a macrostate is defined by the density, volume, pressure and temperature of the gas. The microstates refer to the potential positions and energy states, kinetic energy plus gravitational potential energy, that each of the molecules can possess. Again, under this definition, the greater the volume occupied by the gas, the higher the entropy. Despite its very different approach to the subject, this definition is functionally equivalent to the one that I have already presented, and I'm not going to discuss it any further in this video. Returning our attention to the example we discussed earlier, why is it that when the valve between the two vessels is opened, gas molecules start to move from the left-hand vessel into the right-hand vessel? Is entropy forcing this to happen? Is the vacuum on the right-hand side sucking the molecules in? Our understanding of what's going on here is going to shape our understanding of how the atmosphere responds to the forces applied to it. In the first episode of this series, we saw that gas molecules move independently of one another. They progress along what are called random walks, which are dictated by the initial position and velocity of each gas molecule, the collisions that the gas molecules undergo with one another and any obstacles in their path, and the forces that are applied to the gas molecules, be they reaction forces, electromagnetic forces, or gravitational forces. In the pressure and temperature conditions that apply near Earth's surface, a single cubic centimetre of air contains 27 billion billion gas molecules, with an average velocity of approximately 500 metres per second. In one second, the combined distance travelled by all of those gas molecules is 11.5 trillion metres. So the net flow of gas molecules from the left-hand vessel to the right-hand vessel is simply a numbers game. There are so many molecules moving so quickly that they will cover all of the territory that is available to them, and they will do so very rapidly. But there is no force making this happen. There is no principle that requires it to happen. It is just a result of each particle tracing out its random walk. Entropy is not a force nor is it a source of energy. In fact, entropy is a measure of the amount of energy that the gas packet no longer has available to do work. And this is central to the flat earth misunderstanding of the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics does not describe what will happen, it describes what cannot happen. By definition, all gas packets have a finite thermal energy content which means that there is only so much energy that they can lose that they are no longer able to use to do work. It is not the case that the entropy of a given gas packet can increase ad infinitum. The gas packet just does not have that much energy to lose. Similarly, a vacuum does not apply a force. It is simply an absence of matter. In order to prevent pressure equilibration, all that is necessary is that a force be applied to the gas molecules to prevent their flowing into the region of lower pressure. This force could be a reaction force, such as in our example, which was supplied by the valve, but electromagnetic or gravitational forces will have a similar effect, just less localized. 
So returning to the question of why it is that gas molecules moved from the left-hand side of the vessel to the right-hand side of the vessel, the answer is quite simple. There was just nothing to stop them from doing it. There was no force acting that would prevent it from happening. It is fascinating to me that flat earthers tend to completely ignore the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy. The law of conservation of energy states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only converted from one form to another. We can apply this principle to the case of a body that is denser than air near Earth's surface. Raising this body a distance h further away from Earth's surface requires an amount of energy. That energy does not disappear. It does not vanish. It is not destroyed. It is retained by the body in the form of potential energy. If the body is no longer supported at its new altitude, it will fall towards the Earth. In doing so, it will gain kinetic energy. By the time it returns to its original position, it will have kinetic energy equal to the potential energy that it was given by the lifting process. If we now imagine a body moving upwards with a particular velocity, conservation of energy says that as it goes upwards, it is gaining potential energy and must therefore lose kinetic energy. It will slow down in the vertical component until eventually, because its energy is finite, it is brought to rest. The principle of conservation of energy thus supplies a very convenient form for the distance upward the body will travel before it is brought to rest by the downward acting force. Direct experimentation demonstrates that the principle of conservation of energy applies with equal validity to individual gas molecules. As they move upward, they lose kinetic energy and gain potential energy. As they move downward, they lose potential energy and gain kinetic energy. The mathematical relationship between the change in height and the change in the vertical component of velocity that was derived for the macroscopic case applies with equal validity to the case of individual gas molecules. The range of velocities that gas molecules can have as a function of temperature is given by the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, which is shown here. Earth's mean surface temperature is slightly less than 300 Kelvin. So looking at the diagram, we see that for nitrogen, this gives a mean molecular velocity of approximately 500 meters per second. We can also see that the vast majority of molecules have a velocity that is less than 1000 meters per second in magnitude. Let us consider the case of a nitrogen molecule that has a velocity of 1000 meters per second straight upward. How high would this molecule get before the force of gravity brings it to rest? We can use the formula derived in the previous slide to determine that this distance is about 51 kilometers. Similar results are obtained for oxygen molecules. It is possible for a gas molecule's upward velocity to be increased by collision from behind, as shown in the diagram here. However, these collisions are not particularly common, and for a gas molecule to achieve escape velocity would require a succession of such collisions. Collisions of this sort are vastly more effective for lighter gas species such as hydrogen and helium, and fewer such collisions are required to give these lighter gases escape velocity. So it is these gases that comprise the vast majority of the mass lost from Earth's atmosphere to space but that mass loss is compensated for by outgassing from Earth's interior to maintain an equilibrium. So the principle of conservation of energy suggests that only a very small portion of Earth's atmosphere will make it to an altitude of more than 50 kilometers from Earth's surface. We can compare this result against observations, and in doing so we see that only one ten thousandth of one percent of the atmosphere makes it above this altitude. Yet again, Comparison between theoretical results and observations yields extremely close agreement. So let's summarize our results. Moving away from Earth's surface requires work. As gas moves upward, it expands. As it expands, its entropy increases. A high entropy means that the gas packet has less energy available to do work, which in turn means that it has less energy to climb higher. The principle of conservation of energy requires that a gas molecule near Earth's surface with finite energy can only do a finite amount of work, which means that it can only rise to a finite distance above Earth's surface. Our theory suggests that the vast majority of Earth's atmosphere should lie below an altitude of 51 kilometers, and direct observation demonstrates that this is indeed the case. 
It is worth noting that entropy is not a force, nor is it a source of energy. Entropy does not assist gas molecules trying to escape Earth's gravitational field. In fact, as the entropy of gas packets increases, they have less energy that they can use to escape Earth's gravity. The vast majority of flat earthers will of course deny that there is such a thing as gravity. They are of course wrong and I have already made a video demonstrating why this is the case. I do not feel it necessary to repeat that argument here. Well, that wraps up another episode. Thank you very much for watching, I really do appreciate it. And I hope you'll join me next time when I discuss Nathan Oakley's fatuous claim that helium balloons prove that gravity doesn't exist.